Psalm 1. That's, if you open up to the middle of your Bible, you'll be in the book of Psalms. Um, and it, I think we don't have it on the screen, so you'll have to, have to follow along with me. Blessed are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper." The wicked are not so, but are like the chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. This is the word of the Lord. Very often in the Hebrew tradition, words, first appearances, are deeply important. Um, the, the first time you see the, the use of a word, um, the rabbis will say that that tells you how that word is going to be used for the remainder of uh, the document. So the first couple chapters of Genesis become very, very theologically important for that reason, because we, we have words like good that appear for the first time there, and man, and things that we need to know a lot about. The first word in the book of Psalms, the first word of Psalm 1, Psalm 1, which really serves as a, a prefix to the, the book of Psalms, as, as an introduction, is the word blessed. The Hebrew word, the, the root is asher, happy. Blessed means happy. They, they are synonyms. Blessed is an old-timey religious word for happy, because back in the King James days, you, you would say, have a blessed day, have a blessed birthday, whatever it is. And King James wrote that down in the Bible, and then that Bible was just really good and really effective and poetic, and we liked it for a long time. And it became a word that fell out of practice, except in religious contexts. But it's not originally a religious word. Um, now, it, it should be mentioned that our understanding of happiness has shifted a little bit. What it means to be happy. Um, what it means to have even something like a Merry Christmas. True happiness, I would argue, is a, a feeling that you belong, that you are doing what you're supposed to be doing, that you are inside the will of God. That's a happy person, a, a, a person that's right, a person that's well. It's not unlike, if you remember uh, from a little while ago, our discussion of the, the Hebrew word shalom, right, where it's not just peace in the absence of conflict, but the presence of of well-being, of faring well, and, and being right in the right place. And so, when you give someone a gift, another word for a gift is a blessing. Here, I got you this, this blessing for your birthday. It's something that I, I gave you to make you happy. That's the, the meaning of the word, and that's true in Greek as well as in Hebrew. And throughout the Psalms... And throughout the Old Testament, there are these teachings about what it means to be blessed. There are teachings also throughout Greek philosophy and, and history about eudaimonia, what it means to have the best kind of life. In fact, we have those teachings now, don't we? Have, have any of you had the opportunity to buy tickets to a seminar, maybe going on at the convention center, and how to live the good life? How to live your best life now? How to... How to be free from anxiety. What, what, how to be happy. The Old Testament has some advice for that. Blessed are those whose God is the Lord. It says in Joshua. 
Blessed is he who finds wisdom and he that gains understanding. Blessed is the man who keeps the Sabbath and who keeps his hand from all wrongdoing. If you want to be blessed, you got to do the right things and stay away from the wrong things. You got to you got to follow the Lord your God. Be be the way the Lord is. And so when Jesus had gathered his disciples and his disciples had started to gather disciples around them and there started to be crowds of followers pressing in on him to hear the word of the Lord and he got in in Luke it actually describes him being in a field more than a mount maybe he gave this sermon multiple times um, and he starts and he says blessed he's quoting the old testament He's quoting a a tradition that has been carried through God's people for generations that they are intimately familiar with of verses like Psalm 1. Psalm 1 is an especially good example because Psalm 1 has two paths. That's that's one of the, the possible titles for Psalm 1 that we see in certain contexts. Psalm 1, the two paths. And there is the happy one. Blessed is he who follows in the way of the righteous and does not follow in the way of the sinners. There's that other path, the path that leads to destruction. And Jesus also, in his sermon, has two paths. There's the way of blessing and there's the way of woe. But Jesus flips it. He flips the narrative on everything we've heard about blessing up till this point, which you should get used to if you're not already, because Jesus is always, always flipping it. He's always changing the narrative on us. He has two paths too, but he changes the meaning of what blessed means for him. Because there were people in his time that had heard this story before. There, there were these Pharisees. And, and I want to be clear, Pharisees are not devils. Fa- fa- Pharisees are not these, these diabolical people that, uh, that are, are out to do evil. They, these are well-meaning, wrong religious people. right? These, these are religious people who have swallowed a pill that led them astray. And they know that they're supposed to love the law of the Lord as per Psalm 1. And so they will go out in the streets and show off just how much they love the law of the Lord. And they know that they are supposed to prosper like trees planted by streams. So they will dress elegantly and show off their success before people and they will take the donations given in the temple and use them for their own ends and they will encourage people to be poorer so they can be richer. And they will happily, happily tell you, these Pharisees, how blessed they are and how foolish you are. Because they love the law of the Lord and you don't. Not as much as they do. So Jesus does something with this Psalm 1. He doesn't disagree with it. Jesus and Psalm 1 agree 100%. But he changes the apparent meaning of Psalm 1. He, he does what Jürgen Moltmann calls demythologization. That's a word for you, Maddie. You got that one? Bring that to your spelling bee. Demythologization. <laughs> he, he takes the myth out. There's, there's this myth associated with this concept of blessedness, and he's he just going to take all the religious language out from this teaching. And he says, blessed are the sat upon, spat upon, ratted on. You know, you know who's really blessed? The poor. Blessed are, are the hungry. You, you know who, who really embodies true happiness 
the weeping people. The weeping people, they're happy. Blessed are you. I hope you hear that. I, I, that, that grammatical shift. Blessed are they, blessed are they, blessed are you. When they hate you. When they criticize you, when they persecute you. When you don't think you can go on anymore, blessed are you people. Because that's what the prophets felt like. And when, and when you feel the way the prophets felt, when, when you're engaged in the kind of God that, that brings conviction and that brings challenge and that brings you to a, a new level of faith that you haven't had before, the kind of faith that, as per last week, makes you want to fall down crying in a boat, good, that's it. Now you've got it. Now you've figured it out. Blessed are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers. The Pharisees quoted while scoffing wickedly. And Jesus says, oh, no, 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 no. See, see the Pharisees read that verse. And they read the other verses all through the Old Testament, but somehow along the way, they, they'd become so exposed to it that they became immune. You know how when you're exposed to a cold or a flu virus and you get better and then, and then it doesn't work on you anymore? That had happened with this text. They, they, they'd seen it and yet they'd stopped hearing it. They, they were inoculated. And they were able to rationalize inside their own head that whatever it was they were doing, that must be the right thing. Because they, they were doing it, and they were obviously the righteous. And how do they know they're righteous? Well, because they're in charge, and they get to define what righteousness is. And the disciples, Jesus' ragtag group of followers, poor people and fishermen, and prostitutes, and tax collectors, and rebels. They'd heard this verse too. And they'd been inoculated in their own kind of way. To where it just, it wasn't even condemnation for them, it was just meaninglessness. Right? Oh yeah, I know that song. That's, that's song number one in our hymnals. Yeah, of course I know that one. Um... You, you ever notice the psalms? The first psalm in a hymnal is always, you know, um, in, our, in our Presbyterian hymnal, it's uh, come thou long expected Jesus. You know, it, it's always, a, it's always an old favorite. The Lord watches over the way of the righteous. The way of the wicked will perish. That's what they're saying to themselves. Sure. Sure. Jesus says, no, 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 no. Guys, my disciples, guys. You don't understand. You don't understand. The Lord watches over the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. Let me spell it out for you. Rome is going to fall. And you, my disciples, are going to have a kingdom of which there will be no end. Can you imagine if... If we could just get like closed circuit TV in, into that community of early believers to show them the modern church. Do you, do you think that they could even conceive of a world in which we would name our dogs things like Caesar and Rex? And we would name our children things like Mary and John? The Lord watches over the way of the righteous. The way of the wicked will perish. Don't miss it. Feel how incredibly literal and practical and not at all religious this is. I've, I've got some struggles with biblical literalism. Um, I think that in, in some ways it's run its course, and I think there are certain aspects of the Bible which are written by their original authors to their original audiences very clearly, if you study in context, to be 
metaphorical, to, to be genres of scripture other than literal. But I appreciate that movement in theology so much. Um, it was called Princeton theology early on when it was devised. Because in the early 1900s, when people started doing it, it, it took the inoculation of some of these passages and, and, and let them hit us with full potency, some of us for the first time. And man, if you've got a choice between like reading the Bible and, and missing it versus reading the Bible and, and taking some of the metaphors literally, man, I'll, I'll, pick, I'll pick metaphors literally over, over everything metaphorically any day of the week. Because so much of what Jesus says isn't a metaphor. And it hits you with so much more punch when it is not a metaphor. Blessed are you when they revile you and hate you and persecute you. Blessed are you. I worry that for many of us, I, I, for me sometimes, when I engage this passage... And for many of us, I think it's happening again. In the same way, in the 500 or so years between Psalm 1 and Luke 6, we had people who lost the meaning of Psalm 1. Psalm 1 had lost its punch on them. It became just a religious thing. Just a thing to justify the people that are already there and to be ignored by as as nice poetry the people that are, and I worry that some of us have lost that with the Beatitudes. You know, they, even just saying that, oh yeah, the Beatitudes, right? The, the blessed are's, the, that, that, yeah, blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor in spirit. I hope I can be poor in spirit. That, that we've lost what it has always meant. And, and I worry especially that there are, there are some people to whom this has become a passage to use to talk about how blessed they are. To talk about how they're better than other people. Oh yeah, but you know, I have Jesus, so I'm I'm blessed. And um, you know, you're not, so woe unto you. And that's just the opposite of what this passage means. This passage is always always meant, even when it was in the Psalms, that the people who think that have missed the boat. The sinners who have their own way of doing things, who cut corners, they think they're going to succeed. Man, it's the righteous who are going to prosper. That's what Psalm 1 says. And the same thing says Jesus. Woe to you who laugh, for you will mourn and you will weep. I worry that many of us have decided that we are the poor. That we are the hungry. That we are the persecuted. Because we've we've taken this passage to mean that that like oh maybe I can I can like ideologically hold to this if I like think poor, hungry, persecuted thoughts. And that, that gets weird when you do that. Have you ever met the Christians who kind of develop like a, a holy persecution complex? Because they read the parts of the Bible that say, you know, if, if you follow me, you're going to be persecuted. And so um, they're like, okay, well, whatever I'm doing right now, that must be following him. And I don't feel a lot of persecution, so I'm just going to choose to become really easily offended. And every minor inconvenience, every every time I'm disagreed with, every every, every small thing that goes wrong, I'm going to call that religious persecution. The the Latter-day Saints are really good at this, right? It it gets worse. I don't don't think there's anybody in this room who's there, but, but if you follow that line of thinking too far, you get to a place where you actually desire that kind of rejection and and the feeling of of self-confidence that comes after you're rejected, that you just become obnoxious. And and you start being rude to people 
so that they will persecute you. That's not what persecution means, y'all. Oh, yeah, I had an awkward conversation at work, so I know what the Holocaust is like. No. You don't get to do that. But the truth is, this isn't a passage about try, try to mourn so you can be blessed. Try to, um, try to be poor, try to be weak. This is a passage about Jesus flipping the narrative on the people who think they've got it all together. And giving it to the people who don't. So I don't, I don't care if you are in, in the impoverished church in Cuba that I was in a couple of weeks ago. I hope that they're not reading this passage and be like, oh yeah, blessed are us because we're poor. And so I'm, I'm excited for us now. Because if they do that, they miss what Jesus is trying to do. If you think you're blessed, whoa. Whoa. God exalts the humble, but brings down the mighty from their thrones. If, if, you, if you've defined yourself as the one who is, who is right, who's, who's in the in-group, who's, who's on the right side of God, there's a lot to worry about there. Because there is a very, very strong Christian tradition of God's people consistently trying and doing the wrong thing. But there's another message here, too, that if you're not, like the first community around Psalm 1, returning from exile, seeing the the ruins of their temple, and then over a, a period of decades, seeing a new temple under Ezra that was just a shack compared to the glory of Solomon's temple, and and. And you've got the ruins of your former civilization as you return from, from years of persecution and exile. And you've got the shattered remnants of your history. You've got, you've got some records. You've got some songs. And people remember the songs, but they're all in disarray. And you start to put them together. And you say, I'm going to compile a book. I'm, I'm going to... I'm going to sweep up the broken pieces and I'm going to make something beautiful. And what am I going to say about this beautiful thing I made? I'm going to say that when I think I can't do it anymore, blessed is he who walks in the way of the righteous and does not take the path of sinners. If you're like the the first disciples in the community and, and you think that you're somehow disinherited from the promises of God, that you're, you're excluded, that you're not good enough, smart enough. That's where Jesus says, blessed are you. When you're tired, when you're discouraged, when you think that the last word that you could possibly apply to yourself is the word blessed. That's the moment that the blessedness of our Lord shines through. That's when you get it. If you think you're blessed, it starts to fall through your fingers. And I, I, I want to be clear, that's okay. So, sometimes it's, it's always this undulation with us. Woe doesn't mean you're going to hell when you die, right? Woe means be careful, slow down. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. It's kind of like the gospel in that way. I'm, I'm going to come to a close in just a second. You know, the gospel says that we are saved by grace through faith, that we are sinners. Unable to save ourselves, unable to be righteous, unable even to want righteousness. We, we desire sinfulness at the core of our being unless God does a miracle, unless God comes into us and saves us. And so at the moment when we think that we are good enough to deserve salvation, that's like the one doctrine that, <laughs> that means we've missed the truth. Right? 
It's at the moment that we recognize the truth that we're not good enough. That we recognize the truth that we are lost, that we are sinners, and that we need Jesus to enter in. That Jesus does. And Jesus is willing to enter into our lives and our places and our struggles. If we humble ourselves, we will be blessed.